In this topic video on monetary policy, we're just going to take a short look at quantitative easing, or QE for short. While quantitative easing is an unconventional form of monetary policy, and it's come into being in the UK since 2009, when policy interest rates are at zero, or close to zero, then there can be a limit to what the conventional use of expansion in monetary policy can do. Keynes talked, for example, about a liquidity trap being, uh, being experienced. In the spring of 2009, uh, the Bank of England, the UK's central bank, started to use quantitative easing, or QE, for the first time. The main aim of quantitative easing is to support the level of and growth of aggregate demand in the economy and avoid, for example, the risk of a cyclical recession becoming a much, more, a much deeper deflationary depression. So in this uh, short topic video, we'll look at how QE works and what the arguments are for and against it. So the essence of QE, the Bank of England uses QE as an asset purchase scheme. In other words, they increase the base supply of money in the banking system and they're hoping that interest rates will fall to encourage lending to small and medium sized businesses. The key point is that the bank does not print new money. It's not in that sense, printing money, it just creates money electronically. Uh, it expands its own balance sheet to buy government bonds. Let's have a look at how QE actually works. So what happens? The central bank decides to create new money through QE. It does that by adding money to their own balance sheet. Central banks can do that. Now, this money that's being created electronically is then used by the Bank of England to go into financial markets to buy financial assets. And so far, up to 2016, far and away the biggest single item of spending by the bank has been to use the money created by QE to buy existing government bonds from the commercial banking system. Now, when the government, sorry, when the Bank of England is going into the markets to, to buy bonds, that leads to an increase in the demand for bonds. And for a given level of supply, supply Higher demand for bonds causes an increase in the price. There is an inverse relationship between the market price of a bond and the yield on a bond. That is because the, the interest on a government bond is fixed. The holder receives a fixed amount of interest. And the yield is simply the interest divided by the current market price. So if the price of a bond goes up in the bond market, the yield, the effective interest rate, as a, as a percentage, will go down. Now, yields on bonds in the Treasury bond market are the sort of benchmark, the base for yields and other long-term loans in the economy, including corporate bonds and mortgages. So if QE drives down the long-term interest rate on government bonds, it should also be the case that the interest rate on corporate bonds goes down and mortgages should become cheaper. Those lower interest rates allied to the increased cash in the banking system. Keep in mind, of course, that when the Bank of England buys a bond off a bank, the Bank of England gets the bond, the bank gets the cash. This should then hopefully increase the base supply of money in the economy, stimulate aggregate demand through a rise in household consumption and hopefully also a rise in business investment. So that's how it should work in theory. Just a quick summary. Central bank creates new money goes into the bond markets to buy assets off the commercial banks. They receive cash, which increases their liquidity, and it drives down the long-term interest rate in the financial markets, which in theory should stimulate more investment and more consumption. Now, when we come to evaluating the impact of QE, there are lots of arguments for and against. Here's, here's, here's a selection of them. So one of the arguments for QE is that we were in a very special and a difficult situation in 2009. Interest rates had fallen to very low levels, 0.5%, and yet the economy was struggling to recover. So the argument could be, the point could be made, that QE was needed as an unconventional monetary policy because even low interest rates were proving to be relatively ineffective in bringing about economic recovery. Indeed, John Maynard Keynes wrote about a liquidity trap. This is where even very low interest rates have little impact on consumption and investment because business and consumer confidence is weak 
and the banking system is fragile and often unwilling to lend. So the evidence is that QE is estimated to have cut long-term interest rates by about 1%. And if companies can borrow a little bit more cheaply, and if people can get a slightly cheaper mortgage, that should stimulate demand and crucially help the economy avoid the looming threat of deflation. The counter argument, the evaluation point, could be that cheaper mortgages have actually caused house prices to rise strongly again. And that risks causing even more economic imbalances, in particular making housing unaffordable for people on low incomes. An argument against QE is that the asset purchase scheme of the Bank of England uh, may have caused a fall in long-term interest rates, but actually it's led to an increase in income inequality in some parts of the UK. Or perhaps we should say wealth inequality. Uh, a, lot of the extra, a lot of the extra cash in the banking system has headed uh, either out of the economy into overseas investments, or it may well have flowed into the stock markets. Now, many people own shares, but typically the people who own most shares are those who are already quite well off. A Standard & Poor report in February 2016 uh, hinted that the value of financial assets, including stocks and shares and, and houses, has increased by £600 billion since quantitative easing came in, whereas the average real wage for people in work has actually fallen by 8%. So the argument here is that QE has helped cause asset price inflation, but actually done relatively little to cause real wages in the labour market to go up. The evaluation point of this argument is that without QE, the economy would have struggled to grow. And indeed, we might well have seen a period of sustained price deflation. And uh, deflation, which we cover in a separate topic video, can actually be quite damaging to all groups, regardless of income. So there's an argument against QE with a counter evaluation point. While QE has only been in place since 2009, we're starting to see some of the effects on the wider economy. So this is a topic well worth following if you really want to get a hold of the economics of, of monetary policy. Lots more videos on monetary policy on our YouTube channel. I hope this explained what QE is and how it works and a couple of the arguments for and against. Thanks for joining in and hope to see you again sometime soon.